conference. Uh, welcome back. Uh, before I formally introduce our very distinguished uh, speaker for today's public lecture, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, on uh, Monday, which is the 17th of February, we have a public lecture in the India and Transition Series. A very uh, distinguished figure in the field of public health, Dr. Anand Padke from Pune, who will be speaking on Can We Reach the Goal of Medicines for All? This is at uh, 3 o'clock on Monday in this room. On Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the weekly seminar, there is Dr. Yogesh Snehi, a historian from the Ambedkar University of Delhi, speaking on From Region to the Transnational, Shrines, Vilayat and Sacred Landscapes of the Punjab. On Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we have another lecture in the India and Transition Series, uh, Professor Sudhir Krishnaswamy from the Azim Premji University, Bengaluru, on India's Republican Constitution. And uh, I'll only announce next week's lectures. This is a very long list, in case you were getting worried. Uh, we have a lecture on Thursday at 5.30 p.m., which is by Professor Deepak Pentel in the Science, Society, and Nature Series. Uh, it's on the 20th of February, Thursday, and the title is The Societal Response to Transgenic Crops, Apathy, Ideology, or Fear of the Unknown? Question mark. Question mark is part of the title. Uh, the next conference might be of interest to some of you. We've been talking the, today about unruliness and war making. It's on nonviolent resistance in South Asian history, and it's being done jointly with Professor David Hardiman of Warwick and Professor Tridip Sourud from the Sabarmati Ashram, Ahmedabad. Uh, another small announcement, we are publishing, or we have revived rather, the series of occasional papers of the NMML. Uh, there are 73 which have come out so far. I am sorry, but we are a little behind uh, on our website. I think 32 are up on the website. We will get to 73 very soon, hopefully in the next week or so. But all of them are available for those who can't wait for them to come on the website for a nominal sum of 100 rupees outside. Recent papers include... Uh, Venugopal Madhipati, Building Impressions, Gandhi and Meera Ben's Hut, Rohit Wanchu, Imagining Hindi, Aurub Jyoti Saika, Ecology, Floods and the Political Economy of Hydropa, Vimala, Ramachandra and Equity and Quality are two sides of the same coin in India's school education. And there are two Hindi papers, one by Anamika, Hindi ke Stri Sahitya ke ka Ushakal, and Anirudh Deshpande, Cinema or Itihas Lekhan. But it's a privilege uh, to uh, welcome a very distinguished scholar, uh, Rhodes Professor uh, at Oxford, uh, William Bynart, who I've had the privilege of knowing since my graduate days. Uh, uh, Professor Bynart uh, uh, first came to be known very widely for his uh, extensive work on the uh, political economy uh, of South Africa. He'd written on Ponderland, he'd written on uh, agrarian economy, he'd written on questions of labor, and this is very widely uh, a known work. Uh, for over a quarter of a century, he has also worked on the environmental history of not only uh, South Africa, uh, but of uh, the British Empire at large. His uh, book, which was co-authored in uh, 2008, Environment and Empire, was published by Cambridge University Press with Lotte Hughes. Uh, he was just reminding me, and as happy coincidence has it, he came uh, to our library a couple of days back, uh, uh, just before this conference, and uh, there's a new book section in the library, and it had a new book on livestock and indigenous knowledge, which he has co-authored. And the previous book was on uh, prickly pear. And so I can go on with the long list. We are, we are also very privileged to have William here because uh, he has uh, written uh, one of the authoritative uh, histories of South Africa, 20th century uh, South Africa. And uh, uh, he will be speaking to us, as you know, on a subject uh, which is uh, replete with many meanings on bio-invasions, unruly plants, and biocultural diversity, perspectives from Africa. So without further ado, Professor William Bynard. Thank you very much for inviting me to give the talk. I've really enjoyed the conference so far. My talk grows out of a, a history I wrote with a colleague, Lavuya Wachela, on the prickly pear, an American cactus in this picture, in South Africa, where it's been for probably 300 years. I'm approaching the issue of unruliness at a tangent because I haven't really thought about it. And at times I will just use invasiveness and unruliness as the same sort of concept. My aim is to generalize out from this case study and address the central issue in contemporary environmental history and conservation debates. 
How do we make judgments about a rapidly changing botanical world and evidence of increasing bioinvasion? How do we balance, on the one hand, biodiversity conservation with, on the other hand, a recognition that plant transfers and species plant, uh, transfers more generally have been and remain part of dynamic production systems that have historically underpinned human civilizations. Plant transfers have created incalculable value, really, and they're unlikely to be entirely reversed. There's a linked set of problems around the language and concepts we use to talk about these issues. The term plant transfers is very neutral and it differs from perspectives included in the ideas such as bioinvasion, which scientists use, which is hardly a neutral term, and ecological imperialism. Our language then might reflect our predispositions and influence our analyses, whether we're environmental restorationists, protectionists, or whether we're happy hybridists. And this debate also raises, for me, critical issues around concepts of biodiversity. And if I have time, I want to explore also a newer concept, biocultural diversity, which has been offered as a way to get beyond simply a scientific notion of biodiversity and include cultural elements in the way that we think about biodiversity. So in discussing plant transfers and bioinvasions and really plants with respect to Africa and especially South Africa, I'm deliberately including crops and weeds and plant invaders with the same frame of analysis, within the same frame of analysis because it's very difficult to restrict species within these culturally constructed categories. I'm going to talk about maize, prickly pear, and black wattle, an Australian plant, because each offers a different perspective. Prickly pear and black wattle are particularly good plants to think about these issues with, because they cross continents, they cross boundaries of culture, they cross boundaries of race, and of useful plant, and pest, Sometimes they were crops, sometimes they were weeds, sometimes they were invaders. I'm also trying tentatively to comment on bodies of literature that aren't usually integrated in these debates. On the one hand, the historical and social science approach, the Africanist thinking, subaltern thinking, which usually puts human usage, human need, and especially the need of poor people at the center of the analysis. And on the other hand, the bioinvasion bio literature and ecological economics, which has pioneered this very powerful idea of ecosystem services and their quantification. And these latter two literatures tend to, tend to emphasize the environmental and economic costs of bioinvasions and plant transfers. It's impossible to imagine the modern world without an understanding of the scale of plant transfers. And in ecological imperialism, Crosby suggested an asymmetrical plant exchange where the old world transferred its plants as plants of power to the new world, the Americas. But if we include Africa as part of the old world, in fact, over the last three centuries, there's been an extraordinary countervailing or backwash of American plants to Africa, and Africans have come to depend increasingly on American domesticates. Maize, cassava, sweet potatoes, bean varieties, good varieties, potatoes, tomatoes, tobacco, peanuts, cocoa, avocado, chili, peppers, agave, guava, pineapple, passion fruit, as well as prickly pear, and that's not all of them. It's true that there have also been many plants as it were, from the east, sugarcane, plantains, banana, tea, mango, and citrus. But collectively, plants of American origin, especially maize, are of greater importance. They're probably less important in India, though, of course, chili has become a central element in culinary tastes in India. So African civilizations and African demographic strength has essentially been based increasingly for three centuries on new plants, not indigenous plants. 
Maze is my first example. And Maze is not usually categorized amongst bioinvaders, but it's important to think about the impact of this plant in relation to indigenous biodiversity. It was introduced first by Portuguese traders and slavers to help feed the slave trade. Very soon after it was brought back from the Americas. It has particular value because it can be used as a vegetable after boiling or roasting and as a grain that can be dried, stored and ground. It can also, it's uh, hugely resistant compared to millets and sorghums, which were the indigenous crops, to bird pests, which have been a major problem. And hence, it's a hugely labor-saving plant as well. And the stalks and leaves can also be used as fodder. So McCann illustrates how maize was quite rapidly inserted into the agricultural repertoire of the Ashanti people, who became the largest and most powerful kingdom in Africa from the 17th century. It then spread unevenly in many parts of the continent, initially slowly, but relentlessly. And despite its nutritional disadvantages, a lack of protein compared to sorghum or wheat, it has become the major food crop in Africa during the 20th century. The area under maize expanded from about 14 to 27 million hectares between 1960 and 2005. And since 2006, there's been an extraordinary expansion in southern Africa of smallholder maize production. Malawi took the lead through subsidizing starter packs of fertilizer and seed and tools, and that doubled output, helped to double output in five or six years. So there's a similar picture in Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania, not quite so dramatic. So we're still seeing maize with an expanding frontier. McCann estimates that people in Lesotho, Malawi, and Zambia consume a higher proportion of maize in their diets, over 50% than any other countries in the world. And maize seems to African growers and consumers quintessentially part of African life and culture. It is not, in African view, an exotic. A map in a book of the world through its characteristic grains has Africa indicated by maize and India by Chile, both Latin American plants. Actually, it's a book written by my wife. <laughs> so, maize brought in its wake ecological and increasingly agroecological disadvantages. Simply by clearing land for it, of course, many indigenous species were, were destroyed. And while initially it was often intercropped in mixed fields with beans and pumpkins, interestingly, borrowing the Native American techniques it has increasingly become a monocrop. It prepares ground for weeds, it can quickly exhaust soil and precipitate soil erosion. And McCann argues that it's a significant spreader of malaria, especially most recently in Ethiopia, one of its current frontiers where it's replacing the long-grown teff. By chance, though, maize doesn't become invasive. It's got a very heavy cob, and the seeds are heavy too. They're not easily spread, and the kernels are cooked or ground before eating. Also, the reproductive capacity of the seeds is destroyed when consumed fresh, whether by people or animals. Now, prickly pear is very different, and black wattle too. When prickly pear seed goes through a mammalian digestive tract or that of a bird, its reproductive capacity is enhanced, not destroyed, and that's fundamental to its invasiveness. Nevertheless, maize cultivation has been probably the single most important cause, maybe alongside livestock, of environmental change and degradation in Africa. And should we exclude it from the category by invader simply because it's generally controlled by humans and doesn't spread beyond fields? In fact, should we include humans as the key bio invaders in most environmental contexts? Any environmental critique of maize must be tempered, though, by a recognition that it's the most important and preferred food source in many African countries, especially in southern, central, and eastern Africa. 
Its spread has coincided with massive demographic growth in Africa, although it wasn't directly the cause of this. And Africans largely welcomed and absorbed many American cultivars. Cassava, for example, has also become a key, a key drought and supplementary food crop. American crops and useful plants, and as I will illustrate, bioinvaders advantaged African people, helped underpin pre-colonial power in some context, and bolstered subsistence, economic growth, and demographic strength. Maize was not unruly, depending on how we actually think about that, perhaps, but it was truly transformative and destructive. What about the bioinvaders that might more accurately be thought of as unruly plants in that they needed little human cultivation? Two key South African commentators reflect global literature in arguing human communities and natural ecosystems worldwide are under siege from a growing number of destructive invasive alien species. These species erode natural capital, compromise ecosystem stability, and threaten economic productivity. And the problem is growing in severity. This is fundamentally the scientific view of bioinvasions and plant transfers in some ways more generally. And it's true there are many invasives that seem only to have costs, ecological and economic. For example, American burrweed was the first to be, clear, de be declared a noxious weed in South Africa in the 1860s. It stuck in the wool of sheep, and wool was the major export, along with diamonds, in the 19th century. A recent example in South Africa has been the redwater fern, another American plant which clogged dams and reservoirs, uh, they found an American weevil to counteract it. So it's no longer quite so serious. And in fact, it's, the weevil has been spread through other parts of Africa as well. But many invaders and really plants <coughs> could also serve as valuable self-spreaders. Mesquite or prosopis grown in India as well in fact, in Delhi streets, I discovered yesterday, was deliberately, deliberately introduced in the late 19th century as a fodder and shade plant in the driest pastoral districts of South Africa. In the mid-19th century, agricultural officers were still praising it as possibly one of the best introductions that had ever been made. But it spread rampantly in some areas, displacing in indigenous vegetation, and scientific views have now changed. It is seen by scientists as an invader, although by some pastoralists still as a useful plant. Saltbush is rather similar. It's an Australian species, now classified as a plant invader, but for much of the 20th century it was cultivated or semi-cultivated as a fodder and it spread itself, which of course is a great advantage to pastoral farmers in the drier areas because they don't have water to cultivate fodder. And we could in fact think about lucerne in this context as well, because an enormous amount of water has gone into lucerne cultivation in drier districts where irrigation has been available. And in many ways the growth of lucerne, which is not seen as an invader, is more destructive ecologically or more exhaustive of water than these introduced plants. And lantana, another ubiquitous plant, widespread in India, Australia, as well as South Africa, has invaded forest edges and roadsides as well all over the country. Yet, although you, you can eat it when the berry is ripe, it'll poison you if you eat it when it's green, you say, don't do that. But birds and animals eat it. Um, and many plants, many, sorry, many indigenous animals and birds seem to adapt to these new species, um, and possibly the increase, there's an increase in bird population in relation to some invasive species. And here prickly pear is a very good example because it was spread not least by crows and by baboons.
And Principe is probably, Apuntia is probably the best example of an unruly, self-spreading, useful plant. In the eyes of different people, it could be a crop, a weed, a damaging invader. It had very significant economic value in South Africa at one time. Apuntia species were amongst the very earliest plants brought back from the Americas in the 16th century. The Spanish conquerors soon knew that they were the source of cochineal used by the Aztecs as a deep red colouring. And for a period in the 18th century, cochineal was probably second to silver as by value as an export from Mexico. And it literally painted Europe red in the sense that it changed dye dyeing techniques for cloth, and it changed painting because this provided a, a, richer, a richer red than they'd had before. There is a book called The Perfect Red about cochineal in India as well, and, and uh, the failed attempts to get it going in India. It was almost certainly the source of these reds for African trade goods as well. By the 18th century, Puntia brought back from the Americas that reached much of the Mediterranean, the Canary Islands, the Cape, and India. One species became very widespread in southern Madagascar, an arid area as well, where it became the base of a cattle economy which never existed before. Prickly pear was the most common species, or well, the most common species of prickly pear, Puntia ficus indica, served multi multiple purposes, especially for poor rural communities, as a hedging plant, a fodder, a fruit, and medicinal plant, both in Sicily and Mediterranean littoral, North Africa especially, and also in parts of South Africa. And you can still see it all over the Mediterranean as a hedging plant. And the spread of prickly pear in South Africa in the 19th century coincided with the intensification of white and black pastoralism in areas where water supplies were insecure. So um, animals adapted to it, it was treated, and it became quite an important drought fodder after the thorns were taken off. There were also thornless, thornless varieties. Although it was too low in nutrients to provide a complete fodder, it became very significant as an additional fodder. And when it fruited, as I mentioned before, wild animals also benefited from it. Perhaps the most important thing, though, is that people didn't try to eradicate it. They welcomed it, especially African people. The sweet wild fruits were collected and eaten very widely, both by black and white, and they were sold in the towns. And for over a century, a technique was discovered or found of using an indigenous root to brew from prickly pear. And for over a century, it was probably the major beer in some of the districts where the plant was most common. It is extraordinary in a way it, I wouldn't say it displaced sorghum beer, but the amount of sorghum available to African communities was falling rapidly at this time, and that had previously been the main, the main beer. Prickly pear is the alternative. Prickly pear spread through much of Africa, especially north and northeast Africa. In Eritrea, they're called Belles, and Eritreans who emigre Eritreans are called by the same name because they come back annually, more or less, at the prickly pear fruiting season. And the old Palestinian name for prickly pear, Sabra, was adopted by Israelis as a name for themselves. They say it means that they're spiny on the outside and sweet on the inside. And it's said that you can still see the old Palestinian villages by the remnants, or you could at one time, by the remnants of the prickly pear hedges. <laughs>
in that area. But prickly pear has a problem, and that is that it becomes invasive, and that especially when it becomes invasive, this thorny variety becomes invasive. Uh, it can be very damaging for livestock. Livestock love the fruit, so do wild animals, but the fruit has a thin spicule called a glockid, which sticks in the livestock's mouth, makes their mouths go septic, and a vet described how after eating too much fruit, the animal's guts would literally be rotted from the inside by these spicules. And so commercial pastoral farmers, and increasingly the state, began an eradication campaign in the early 20th century. They turned against this plant. In the 1930s, dense stands commanded about one million hectares and there were many other parts that were partially invaded. They introduced cochineal insects, the same that had given the color different species, and a moth called the Cactoblastus from the Americas in South Africa's first great biological eradication experiment, which echoed that in Australia, and more or less blasted the thickets away. By the 1970s, 80s, the amount of prickly pear had been reduced by about 90%, and it became illegal to spread the plant. It's a weed. It's an illegal weed under legislation in South Africa. You can't even handle it. Like many laws in South Africa, and I expect elsewhere, most people ignore it. So there's still quite a thriving trade in prickly pear sales, picking and sales, and brewing to some extent in the small towns of the areas, the districts, the far fewer districts where it still survives in any quantity. And poor people still grow it in their gardens. There's, quite a, there's a spineless cactus, uh, a, slight, a variety of the Opuntia ficus indica. But the plant has, has inserted itself into rural lives. And I expect it remains part of a local economy even at this tail end of the prickly pear era. It still provides a small income for rural and small town women. In our book on prickly pear, we try to argue about the distributional issues around eradication. So not only we're trying to illustrate the quite public debates and the huge documentation about whether this plant was a good thing or a bad thing, and invasive or not, but that the eradication fundamentally affected poor people. And I find, I mean, the point for me is critical, and I'll come to it a little bit later, but that rural people, the peasantry in southern Africa, has come to depend on plants that are imported, and in the case of plant like prickly pear, largely invasive. And so issues of whether rural people, in the way that they manage their environment, are helping to manage biodiversity, then become central, and I'll try to explore that a bit further. Black wattle illustrates other points in this debate. It's an Australian plant introduced in the 1860s into southern Africa grown initially on plantations and in government woodlots. And foresters specifically encouraged African people to grow it or encouraged small plots in African areas in order to protect indigenous trees. So African people started planting it around their homesteads as a quick growing source of timber and fuel and shade in the higher rainfall districts on the east coast. It could be pollarded, and critically, it also spread itself. So you didn't have to plant it all the time. If you put in black wattle, it was going to spread, potentially. Here you can see it's actually around the homestead boundaries, but it was a hugely successful plant in South Africa. Just as a plantation plant, South Africa became the biggest producer in the world and started exporting wattle bark back to Australia. It was used for tanning. And it was a very good plantation plant because you could use 
the bark for tanning, and that left you with the pole for timber. Um, so it had a dual use, which by no means all timber plants have. But, as you can see from this recent picture, it became invasive here along a roadside. And it was estimated by about 1990 that 2.5 million hectares had been invaded. Wattles, black wattles, interesting for the same reasons as prickly pear. It creates havoc with our categories and our concepts. It's everything. It's a farmed plant. It's an invasive plant. It's a useful plant, and it's a dangerous plant. And therefore, it's interesting to try to think about how it's been regarded and how this has shifted. It's also one of the very few invasive species for which some attempts have been made at a systematic cost-benefit analysis. And scientists and conservationists agree overwhelmingly about its costs because it's a thirsty plant, like many Australian wattles and eucalypts, and hence it has significant negative impacts on water resources and biodiversity. In 2001, the economic value of the water flow lost to black wattle was calculated this is just in one province, KwaZulu Natal, at 1.4 billion US dollars a year. Now, this focus on water loss is significant because there's a very inventive program in South Africa called Working for Water, where poor rural people are trained to eradicate invasives and are paid to eradicate invasives. And the inventors of the program are conservationists who want to eradicate or counter by invasion. But the government is not least interested in it because it's a way of getting welfare money to poor rural districts. So it serves both those functions. Now, ecosystem services calculations, which underpin this sort of thinking, have become increasingly important in contemporary biodiversity debates because they force attention on the economic as well as ecological losses. They enable conservationists to debate on even terms with policymakers, hard-headed global leaders. But this calculation, this 1.4 billion, seems to me slightly suspect. And the first point is that they calculated, they estimate the amount of water, nobody knows how many black wattle trees there are, but they estimate the amount of water that black wattle trees are drinking. In, and then they cost that water at the cost that it would be in a reticulated urban system. But of course, it's very unlikely that all of the water drunk by black wattles would go down to dams and into reticulated systems. And they don't have any kind of costing for the vegetation, what the vegetation, indigenous vegetation, would use that would replace the black wattle either. I think the monetary value, if we think about it that way, rather than simply as an opportunity cost, may be considerably lower. And then we should turn to the benefits. Let's agree about the $363 million in plantation production. But the building materials and other use are $21 million. So this cost-benefit does look at peasant use. And they actually did a survey as well. Very interesting. One of the first that was done. Um, but here, if we switch and say, OK, the value of black wattle poles for African people in building um, is $21 million. But of course, if they're gone, then they have to use concrete blocks or other such resources. So maybe if we turn that into an opportunity cost figure, I'm going to put it up a lot. And firewood, particularly. So that's quite a generous figure for firewood, just one province of South Africa. But what they don't include is that they only include the cost of potentially purchasing firewood. They don't include the cost of women's labor. And if women didn't have black wattle around their homesteads, which is a huge boon, um, they would have to – sorry, I've got a bit out of order here – they would have to carry water, uh, go on trips to carry wood, as many do even now in the rural areas. And I've calculated at the minimum wage in 2001 when this survey was initially done, um, we could add 250 million as the cost of 
women's labour involved in getting black wattle. And then in addition to that, they don't include all the kinds of uses. So timber would be the framework of these huts, traditional huts. I took this photo in the 70s, sleds, um, frameworks for huts, fences. Wood is ubiquitous in these older peasant households. And I don't know how you begin to cost it. It just is one of those very, very elusive things. Um, so my feeling is that if we look at these figures through in other ways, we could come to very different conclusions. And I've done a, another calculation here which says that the decline in water supply, the loss in water supply, is probably a lot less than 1.4 billion, let's say a billion. And if we bump up the others, we get to a billion as well. Plus, we have the ecologic ben ecological benefit of saving indigenous forest. Then, a point that's terribly important to me is that how do we cost the beauty, in my eyes, <laughs> the aesthetic beauty of a traditional homestead layout? And I should say this with caution, because um, this is not in the cost-benefit analysis, but unfortunately many rural people don't want to live in these huts anymore either. I'll explain in a moment. But that's something else I think we could add. And there's a medicinal value because the bark has high tannin content, so it's been adopted into indigenous medicines as well. These are complicated scenarios. All I'm trying to say is you can do what you like with numbers. And I think that you can make ecosystem services calculations um, show different things. Or that, let's put it this way, I find ecosystem services approaches potentially exciting. Um, here we can, we can use these figures to show the value of indigenous plants and indigenous landscapes, for example, here in connection with water supply. But in this case, they're not being used against multinational companies to prevent deforestation. They're being used, in a sense, as an argument to eradicate a plant that's not insignificant to poor rural families. And that complicates matters for me enormously. And cost-benefit is a dangerous world to be in, um, I think, if you want to be definitive. You can think about these things in all sorts of different ways. And they are using this argument, especially that key 2001 article, to justify the eradication of, of black wattle. And I'm wondering whether that's entirely legitimate. Now, a few studies have been done in recent years which explore in much more detail the value of black bottle to sorry I've got a bit out of sync with my slides I'm at my the limits of my capacity here my technological capacity a few studies have been done recently which have shown reasonably conclusively the significance of black bottle for rural communities one in fact done to illustrate um, this argument in connection with working for water says whilst the program provides an income to thousands of families in rural areas it might also be jeopardizing the livelihoods of some communities the wattle is important resource for village households virtually all households used in the survey used it as a primary heat source and for building materials and so on so it's a complicated scenario and we we are working in a world of very inexact figures my very limited acquaintance with ecosystem services literature suggests well biodiversity is a central a central concept in ecosystem services literature suggests that the value it places is essentially on undisturbed environments. 2010 was the 
International Year of Biodiversity. And if you look, for example, at the key article published in Nature by Pavan Sukhdev, who was the sort of lead author um, in, for, for the research effort, um, it deals almost entirely with an argument for indigenous biodiversity. He works with a rather purist or nativist concept. It's a world of value without plant transfers, without invasive species, without crops. And for me, this is potentially a fundamental problem. Same year, the UNEP report, Dead, Planning, Dead Planet, Living Planet, a beautiful volume, argued a similar kind of line and reaffirmed his point that biodiversity, indigenous biodiversity, is most valuable to poor communities and poor people. But my examples, I think, suggest that we cannot assume, historically speaking, that poor people favored indigenous plants or derived more value from them. This is almost certainly not the case for most African communities. And those that I've interviewed in don't generally have a clear concept of indigenous. So plants are thought of in other ways rather than indigenous or not indigenous. It's not a major category. Now, South Africa might be unusual on a global scale because of the number of invasives, over 7,000, and the way that they've entered into poor house, the usage of poor households. But I'm not convinced about this. I think our model for bioinvasions and our model for, bio, for, for ecosystem services is essentially the deep Amazon. In other words, we're looking at two ideal types here, perhaps. The deep Amazon, where people live off the forests with no invasives at all, and places like South Africa. I've recently visited Kenya a few times, and I think the same applies there. The densely settled peasant communities around, in a ring around the whole of Mount Kenya essentially are farming and growing exotics. The street vendors who have a lively nursery trade in Nairobi are selling entirely exotics. Um, there aren't, I joke that it'd be hard pushed to find an indigenous plant in Nairobi. That's not quite true, except in the botanical gardens and, and similar places. So Michael Sowell, a very well-known American ecologist or conservationist, in fact argued some years ago that the policy of blanket opposition to exotics will become more expensive, more irrational, and finally counterproductive as the trickle becomes a flood. Only the most offensive exotics will be eliminated in the future. And he suggested that we will have to think of other concepts as a way of understanding most of the world. And this is the problem about the purist or nativist view of biodiversity, that it doesn't apply to the settled parts of the world. And the settled parts of the world are almost all of the world. And actually, us subalternists and Africanists all argue that wildernesses, well, actually even Americanists are arguing it now, Cronin's article, that there's no such thing as a wilderness. All wildernesses are, as it were, man-made or to some extent influenced by people. So this is the problem, is that we have a concept of biodiversity currently in its nativist form, which is applicable to relatively few parts of the world, unless all we want to see is degradation. I think that these concepts of biodiversity also lack a historical dimension. I mean, South Africa, for example, has 7,000 introduced species, as I mentioned. Britain is irredeemably hybrid. And there's been a, an interesting growing recognition of this point in literature by environmentalists and ecologists. A recent article in Nature by Thomas said, quote, the response of people who find themselves invaded by such displaced species is often irrational. Deliberate persecution of the new just because it's new is no longer sustainable in a world of rapid global change. 
Actually, he says that with such confidence, without reference to other arguments of biodiversity. I found it quite unnerving. But having made this argument, I want to qualify it in a few ways, because the issues are very complex. Firstly, it's a typically Africanist argument. We almost automatically now, in our sort of anti-imperial, anti-scientific um, critique of quantification mode, tend to be anti-conservation. Conser this is one of the most intriguing elements, I think, in the different continental literatures, in that in Europe and to extent the States, conservation is still seen as a rather positive thing, whereas in much of the Africanist and subaltern literature, it's not. I've argued in a number of recent papers that this critique of science and conservation can lead to a kind of analytical closure, and we should be very cautious about automatically falling back on these positions in a critique of science. So that's my first qualification. Secondly, we need to hold in mind the big picture. Um, the big picture still is, I think, of major and rapid changes to indigenous biodiversity. And there are so many different agents in it. It's a central issue in world history. But thirdly, we need to think like historians about the recent past and the future as well as the more distant past. And the position is changing. So in South Africa, barbed wire and corrugated metal are beginning to replace plants for hedging, especially in denser settlements, but even in rural areas. Rural elect electrification is changing the demand for fuel. Building materials are changing, so you see here a new corrugated metal roof, even where you've got a black wattle plantation just next door, and where there have been thatched. Th these older huts would have been used, would, would have used the trees as, as a, a framework. And roofs are increasingly shifting away from thatch and wooden poles to cut wood. And even in the case of prickly pear, although some survives, tastes are changing. So the beer now, for example, is seen very much as the beer of the poorest of the poor. It's what farm workers and shack dwellers drink. And more and more people have money to go to taverns and drink manufactured beer. And similarly, other fruits are available. So I like to romanticize the prickly pear, but rural people don't necessarily all still. It is still quite, a, it's still quite widely drunk. It's not a plant that's essential to poor rural communities in the way that it was in some districts, perhaps 50 or more years ago. Very few people bother to spend the labor to process now that there's more cash in rural economies and you can purchase. So the dynamics of change might be shifting the cost-benefit analysis. And we need to be cautious about a romantic view of rural life which um, suggests that it might stay the same. And of course, aesthetic views change at all different levels. I mean, rural people themselves are building increasingly square houses with corrugated metal roofs. And in South Africa, Pretoria was called Jacaranda City because this American plant was ubiquitously planted along the avenues, very beautiful in many ways. But it's now considered as an invasive and has ceased to be planted. Similarly, in the Western Cape, which has an extraordinarily diverse fainbos, it's called a fainbos biome, I think more plants per square kilometer than anywhere else in the world. It's been hugely damaged by urbanization, by, um, by agriculture and, and so on, and fires. And there's been a great movement to support it. So we have to allow for these changes in taste, aesthetic changes as well. I'm trying to find ways of thinking myself out of these complications and dilemmas. One th 
issue is how we think about biodiversity. What does biodiversity mean now? And I don't really understand the science, but as I do understand it, they're very different elements. I mean, one is in a particular area is the diversity of indigenous plants, and then another measure is the diversity of endemic plants. But the actual number of species is also measured in some calculations of biodiversity. And then there are other genetic and molecular measures that are being used now, which I really don't fully understand the implications of. But for someone like Thomas to write in Nature, and for this to be accepted, that non-indigenous plants can add to biodiversity, seems to me so fundamental a shift in the nature of the concept and how it's being used, that it calls for a great rethinking. So the question is, does prickly pear, along with indigenous aloe and acacia karoo, all thorny plants characteristic of South Africa, um, does it add to biodiversity or does it diminish biodiversity? And if it adds to biodiversity, then why should it be eradicated or controlled? And I expect the question is then, does it, does it cause... Um, does it exterminate other species? And the answer is, I expect it possibly can. And here's the problem as well, that the issue of biodiversity depends very much on the question of scale. So at a sort of very small scale, the addition of significant invasives can, of course, change things and can result where you have plants or animals with very small ranges in the extermination of species which is not, I'm not such a relativist that I feel that that is a justified argument, if preventable. But on a continental scale or a national scale, of course, 7,000 7, additional species might potentially add to biodiversity. And in fact, there are some ecologists who argue that invasive species or introduced species can find niches where they, and of course, especially if they can provide value, as I've suggested a number of these plants do, where they don't damage indigenous plants. So, to go back to unruly, what is unruly and what isn't unruly in the world of plants and bioinvasions? I've got a further section, but I've probably taken enough time, and I'll stop there. <laughs>